in the context of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease, the official position of the American Heart Association on the haemoglobin A1c, or the HB A1c, is that a goal of 7% or less is reasonable for certain patients, like those with a short duration of diabetes mellitus and long life expectancy. However, because clinical studies have failed to show a clear advantage from intensive glucose control and cardiovascular events, the recommendations also state a goal between 7 and 8% is reasonable in other instances. The main non-insulin agent used in the treatment of diabetes is metformin, and it's been shown to reduce the incidence of heart attack. Two or more medications are often necessary for the optimal treatment, and not all medications are created equal in terms of the cardiovascular risk. For example, Avandia, a member of a commonly used class of medications called thiazolidines, have been associated with an increase in cardiovascular risk. Since the development of these two newer class of medications for diabetes, with clear cardiovascular benefits have been introduced. Sodium glucose co-transporter 2, or SGLT2 inhibitors, block the kidney's ability to bring the glucose back into the blood after filtering it, and this leads to increased excretion of glucose into the urine. A clinical trial looking at the cardiovascular effects of the SGLT2 inhibitor in patients with type 2 diabetes demonstrated a reduction in death from cardiovascular causes and non-fatal heart attack and stroke. This benefit has been shown to extend to other medications in the class. Glucagon like peptide 1 or GLP-1 analogues are injectable medications and they're useful for the treatment of diabetes because they stimulate the release of natural insulin. Notably, two members of this class of medication have been shown to reduce cardiovascular disease event rates. Body weight, body mass index and waist circumference are often recorded as vital signs along with the blood pressure and the pulse rate at a healthcare provider visit. The goal from the American Heart Association is a BMI between 18.5 and 24.9 kilograms per meter squared and a waist circumference of less than 40 inches in men and 35 inches in women. Because even modest weight loss improves the risk factors for atherosclerosis, for those who weight loss is advised, an initial goal of 5-10% to of the loss of the body weight is appropriate. Previously, many healthcare providers believed the so-called obesity paradox, which is the belief that being overweight or obese had a protective effect on certain cardiovascular risk parameters. This notion was originally supported by some scientific evidence, but subsequent large studies, including one published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2018, cast overwhelming doubt. The JAMA study, which pooled data from 10 separate studies, involved nearly 200,000 patients over 50 years, and it concluded being obese with a BMI of 30 to 39 was associated with a shorter lifespan and a definite increase in cardiovascular disease incidence and death from cardiovascular disease. Those who were overweight with a BMI of 25 to 29 had a definite increased risk of cardiovascular disease compared to the group with a BMI of 18.5 to 24.9. Chelation therapy refers to an intravenous infusion of a compound called disodium ethylene diamine tetracetic acid or EDTA and this chelates or binds certain blood electrolytes like calcium and cadmium. Once advocated by some to be helpful in the treatment of atherosclerosis the promise of the benefit was subsequently debunked by controlled studies. However the thinking on chelation therapy has evolved again. In light of a new trial showing some benefit the American Heart Association said the usefulness of the chelation therapy is uncertain to reduce the cardiovascular events in patients with stable ischemic heart disease. A large-scale randomised control trial to assess the benefits of chelation therapy plus a multivitamin in people with diabetes and a long history of cardiovascular disease is underway. EECP is a procedure that involves inflating pressure cuffs on the legs 
to aid the lower extremity circulation return. It was shown to improve cardiac output in a small study on eight patients with angina. The researchers speculated the effect may have arisen as the result of the increased peripheral oxygen demand. It's typically administered over 35 treatment sessions spanning seven weeks, five days per week for one hour per treatment. It received FDA approval in 1995 for the treatment of angina pectoris when symptoms do not respond to most other treatments. In 2014, the data was re-examined and it was concluded that it may be considered for the relief of refractory angina in patients with stable ischemia. The 2014 multi-society guidelines on the management of patients with stable ischemic heart disease concluded most of the data was derived from small heterogeneous studies and more studies are needed to strengthen the recommendation for the EECP. EECP has been studied in the context of heart failure. The prospective evaluation of enhanced external counterpulsation in congestive heart failure trial from 2006 found it improved the quality of life and the exercise tolerance. However, in the study, it only satisfied one of the two predetermined endpoints. It improved the percentage of the subjects with a 60 second or more increase in exercise duration, but it didn't improve the VO2 max. Another study showed that it reduced myocardial oxygen demand by 19% in patients with left ventricle dysfunction. It was also shown to have some potential for utility in other conditions in small early studies. In a preliminary study, it was shown to be safe and feasible for patients with acute ischemic stroke, with minor improvements in blood flow velocity in the middle cerebral artery. Because it's non-invasive and generally well tolerated, there's little downside to asking a healthcare provider whether the EECP can benefit you. Inflammation plays a role in the development and the progression of atherosclerosis and complications such as heart attack and stroke. Colchine is an anti-inflammatory drug and it's used to treat gout and familial Mediterranean fever. It's often used off-label to treat pericarditis, a condition where supportive tissue surrounding the heart becomes inflamed. A randomised control trial called the Colchine Cardiovascular Outcome Trial in 2019 assessed the benefits of the colchine in people who had a heart attack within the past 30 days. The participants received either 0.5 milligrams of colchine or placebo every day and they were followed for nearly 23 months. A total of 4,745 participants were randomised in the study. The primary endpoint was a composite of death due to cardiovascular causes. Resuscitated cardiac arrest, heart attack, stroke or urgent hospitalisation for chest pain leading to coronary revascularization. The composite outcome occurred less frequently among the subjects randomised to the colchine. Specifically, the endpoint occurred in 7.1% of the subjects taking the placebo and only 5.5% of those taking the colchine. The overall composite reduction with the colchine was driven largely by pronounced reductions in incidence of stroke and urgent hospitalisation for chest pain requiring the coronary revascularization. Because the results of this trial were limited by the relatively short follow-up and they're applicable only to people who've had a heart attack within the past 30 days, many experts are waiting for more evidence before implementing post-heart attack colchine as a standard part of clinical practice. Weighing the risks and the benefit is important because the colchine has been linked to myelosuppression and muscle toxicity at therapeutic doses. Although these adverse effects appear to be relatively uncommon, kidney or liver dysfunction might increase the risk of adverse effects. And people who are taking the colchine should avoid grapefruit juice and certain drugs that are metabolised by the CYP3A4 enzymes. In some cases, a more invasive atherosclerosis treatment might be advised, 
for example, the best approach to the treatment of certain patients with atherosclerosis and ischemic heart disease is to mechanically restore the coronary artery blood flow with surgery or catheter-based intervention. With a coronary artery bypass graft, a healthy blood vessel from elsewhere in the body is stitched around a severe coronary artery plaque to bypass the plaque and restore the blood circulation to the heart muscle. The several variations of the surgery, but all involve significant risks and prolonged recovery periods. In a catheter-based intervention, the heart is accessed through a puncture in the wrist or the groin artery to deliver a catheter to the coronary artery. The inserted end of the catheter is then equipped with a balloon and it's inflated in a procedure called an angioplasty, thereby relieving a blood flow problem caused by a significant coronary plaque. After removal of the balloon, in most cases, a metallic stint is permanently implanted at the site of the angioplasty to prop open the artery and to maintain the blood flow. These more invasive treatments are reserved for very severe and extensive coronary atherosclerosis because mechanical blood flow restoration has been shown to reduce the risk of death in these cases. In less severe cases, invasive treatments are employed if medications lifestyle changes and external procedures fail to adequately relieve the chest pain, breathlessness or fatigue that can be caused by ischemic heart disease. Results from a large ischemia trial in 2019 suggest for selected patients with stable ischemic heart disease, optimal medical therapy might be just as effective as more aggressive invasive approaches using certain cardiac catheterization and revascularization. Dietary fatty acids can be broadly categorised as saturated, monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. The difference lies in the variation in the chemical bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen atoms in the backbone of the fatty acid molecule. Saturated fatty acids are relatively linear molecules. On the other hand, because of the effect of the carbon to carbon double bonds, the unsaturated fatty acids have bends or kinks in their fatty acid chain. The monounsaturated fatty acids have one double bond, while the polyunsaturated fatty acids have two or more double bonds. Trans fats are unsaturated fats, but they have a linear configuration of saturated fats. Overall, dietary monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids are healthy, while saturated fats and trans fats should be avoided. The American Heart Association recommends consuming monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats to replace the saturated and trans fats in the diets to improve the lipid profile and to reduce the cardiovascular risk. The richest dietary source of monounsaturated fatty acids is olive oil. Certain other vegetable oils contain abundant monounsaturated fatty acids such as canola, peanut, soybean, rice bran, sesame and high oleic sunflower oils as do whole almonds, cashews, peanuts and avocados. The most studied dietary monounsaturated fatty acids with the vast body of evidence for benefit to the cardiovascular health is extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil is a source not only of abundant monounsaturated fatty acids but also bioactive compounds including polyphenols and it's a superior source of polyphenols compared to other grades of olive oil and other culinary oils. Extra virgin olive oil and olive polyphenols exert a range of beneficial effects that can lower cardiovascular disease risk, including vasodilatory effects, anti-inflammatory activity, defense against oxidative stress, improved lipid profiles and HDL functionality, and even blood sugar control. A study published in mid-2020 examined the association between dietary olive oil intake in the United States and cardiovascular risk. The study followed over 92,000 subjects for up to 24 years. Those whose olive oil intake was greater than half a tablespoon per day had a lower risk of cardiovascular disease overall, as well as a reduction in coronary heart disease. Importantly, the study also found replacing 5 grams per day of margarine, butter, dairy fat or mayonnaise with the equivalent amount of olive oil 
was associated with a lower cardiovascular disease risk. An earlier 4.8 year long controlled clinical trial in close to 7,500 individuals at high risk of cardiovascular disease found a 31% reduced risk of major cardiovascular events in those who were following a Mediterranean diet who supplemented with extra virgin olive oil compared to those on a control low fat diet. As previously mentioned, the ideal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids is 4 to 1. However, the typical Western diet has a ratio of almost 20 to 1. Most people have a diet deficient in omega-3 and too high in omega-6 when compared to the diet that humans evolved with. This change in the dietary composition parallels the rise in overweight and obesity in Western society. Elevated levels of omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids and high omega-6 omega-3 ratios promote many chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease. Three large controlled scientific studies have provided evidence that greater polyunsaturated fatty acid intake is associated with a reduction in the incidence of cardiovascular events in those with atherosclerosis. A 2019 meta-analysis found that greater omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid intake was associated with reduced cardiovascular risk in long-term studies that provided follow-up of 10 years. Regarding omega-3 supplementation in the context of cardiovascular outcomes, the controlled trials performed to date have varied a great deal in their design and methods. Not surprisingly, study results and interpretations of the findings have been inconsistent. However, as of late 2019, the benefits of a higher omega-3 dose have become apparent. A meta-analysis published in the Journal of the American Heart Association pulled data from 13 randomised control trials involving nearly 130,000 participants. This analysis found a dose-response relationship between omega-3 supplementation and a reduction in the risk of several cardiovascular outcomes. This is, higher doses of omega-3 supplementation were linked to greater risk reduction. A 2020 analysis evaluated the effects of omega-3 dosing on cardiovascular outcomes in a combined total of more than 135,000 participants and it showed supplementation with 400 to 5,500 milligrams per day of omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, reduced the relative risk for fatal heart attack by 35%. Other cardiovascular benefits include a relative risk reduction of 13% for any heart attack, 10% for adverse events from coronary heart disease, and 9% for mortality from coronary heart disease. Furthermore, higher doses of omega-3 supplementation result in more cardiovascular protection. For every 1,000 mg per day increase in EPA and DHA, up to 5.5 grams per day, the relative risk of cardiovascular events and heart attack decreased by 5.8% and 9% respectively. Other studies suggest the omega-3 supplementation can be particularly useful in certain subgroups of people. For example, a controlled trial involving approximately 7,000 patients with heart failure found omega-3 supplementation reduced the risk of death or hospitalisation due to cardiovascular causes. One trial demonstrated fish oil supplements reduced the risk of death in people who suffered a heart attack within the past three months. The American Heart Association recently declared polyunsaturated fatty acid supplementation is reasonable to help to prevent cardiac death in patients with prevalent coronary heart disease and to help to prevent outcomes in those with heart failure. More recently, in a large multicenter trial, over 8,000 patients with atherosclerosis and elevated blood triglycerides were randomised to receive a highly purified prescription form of omega-3 fatty acid EPA. The group had a significant drop in the risk of heart attack, stroke and death from any cardiovascular cause. A post hoc analysis further found that the fish oil group had a 34% reduction in first revascularization procedures. 36% reduction in total revascularization. Stenting procedures were reduced 
32%. And additionally, 16 controlled human trials concluded omega-3 fatty acid supplementation beneficially affects vascular endothelial function. For more on atherosclerosis, herbs, supplements or natural treatment plans, check out my website.